In this video, we're going to be looking at the start of the Reformation, a time period in the Western world where we have a lot of upheaval in the Catholic Church um, and eventually a s another split in Christianity. Uh, up to this point, we've seen a split between the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church, and now we're going to see a split again between the Roman Catholic Church and what we're going to call Protestantism. And the person that we're going to be focusing on for the beginning of this split is someone called Martin Luther. Now, up to this point, there had been a few criticisms of the Catholic Church, uh, people that were saying that the church was corrupt. Um, there's a lot of different examples of this that doesn't necessarily reflect on the religion as much as it reflects on the people that were in charge of the religion at the time. There were popes that fathered children. There were priests that didn't know what they were doing. Uh, people that were... Uh, they were people that were gambling away all the church's money, drinking heavily, having kids themselves. Uh, popes, as we saw, tried to gain a lot of secular power, and so they actually competed a lot with the king. And there was just a lot of corruption, and people didn't really know that people in the church, people that were working in the church, were actually the most holy people. So there was a lot of people that were a little bit, little bit on edge. And by the time that we get Martin Luther popping up, remember, we've had things happen like the Great Schism, uh, two Great Schisms actually, one with the breaking of the Eastern Orthodox Church, and then another schism where people actually stole the Pope and brought him to France for a while. And then another Pope popped up, and you know, no one knew who was in charge. And then we had the Black Death where a whole bunch of people died, and people said, why, why, why is this happening? And so by the time that we get someone like Martin Luther going around and sharing his ideas, uh, there's a lot of unrest, I think would be fair to say. So a little bit about his background, um, living there at the, right around 1500. Um, he joined the church as you would at, you know, really early age and then officially joined the church at 21. Uh, mostly, you know, his parents wanted him to become really successful. They really pushed him to become a lawyer, sent him through school and all those different things. And eventually he gets into a tough situation where he almost dies. And he says, if I'm spared, I'll become a monk. I will dedicate myself to the church. And he lives, and at 21, he joins the church. Um, he quickly rises within the church. He becomes a university professor, um, eventually in Wittenberg, in Saxony, and uh, becomes quite adept at what he does. Um, his goal is never to start a religious revolt, according to a lot of sources. Uh, he just saw a lot, of, a lot of problems that were arising, just like several other people did. And uh, he pointed them out and actually inadvertently, in a way, caused the split. A lot of people think that if it wouldn't have been him, it would have been somebody else, because there had been a few people up to this point, including a guy named John Huss, John Wycliffe, several people that had also been stirring the same pot that he had, uh, but maybe he was the last straw. So what are some things that he's challenging in the church? Uh, one is something called an indulgence. Now, indulgences had been used in the church for a long time. Um, basically, an indulgence is something that pardons your sins so that you can go to heaven a little bit faster. And to be honest, when we talked about uh, different religions, talked about the afterlife in Christianity, we talked about uh, heaven and hell, and people would want to go to heaven and not want to go to hell. But in some traditions, there is this idea of purgatory. So if you were on your way to heaven, but you didn't leave the best life, you might have to wait in purgatory for a while before you're actually able to get up into heaven. And the idea of an indulgence, a lot of times, allowed you to kind of cut the line in purgatory and get quicker into heaven. Um, so these are pretty popular. Um, you wouldn't necessarily buy them for yourself. A lot of times you'd buy them for other people that you loved, buy them for, you know, dead grandparents or um, uncles or maybe for your kids for the future. Um, but one thing that was going around was uh, this guy named John, uh, John Tetzel, Johann Tetzel, and he was uh, a friar who was sold, selling indulgences. They were trying to raise money. So they would sell these little slips of paper and these promises, uh, get into heaven quicker cards, um, to pay for St. Peter's uh, Basilica, St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome, uh, the actual church in Vatican City. They were trying to build that into what it is today. They needed more money, so they decided to fundraise by selling indulgences. Uh, now, he thought that was kind of silly, Martin Luther did. Um, he saw a lot of people that were already really poor, that were already spending all their money just trying to survive, and then they were putting extra money into this. And he said, you know, if the Pope has the power to grant people quicker access into heaven, why wouldn't he just do it out of his own 
goodness and love for the people of the world than make them pay for it. Um, so he had a lot of problems with that and with some other things. He wrote up 95 reasons, 95 theses that he thought were problematic in the church. And what he actually did was he nailed them up to the church door in the city that he was living in, in Wittenberg. Uh, now, some people think of this as being really dramatic. At that time, church doors got used a lot of times as like message boards, kind of like if you're at Caribou or Starbucks and they have the cork board where everyone puts their announcements, that sort of an idea. And he put all his ideas up there and he didn't realize that it was going to set off such a big debate. So there is one image of what it might have looked like. And you can see nailing big old piece of paper to the door. So what happens uh, when we talk about a reformation? Uh, it's a movement for religious reform. Basically, his ideas took off. People thought, oh, yeah, maybe that's something that should be done. And some of them were much more inflammatory than others. Some of his ideas, some of the 95. Um, but basically people saying, let's try to fix some of this stuff. Maybe the Pope doesn't have all the answers. Maybe we need to change a few things. And his ideas really start this, this changing process. Um, a couple of his major ideas were the idea, or one of them was that people can only get salvation. They can only go into the afterlife, reach heaven through faith in God. Um, and Jesus, and instead of going through the church. So in the Middle Ages, there was this really strong emphasis on the hierarchy of the church. You had to go through the church to get salvation, and if you didn't go through the church, if you got excommunicated, you'd be going directly to hell. And he said, maybe the church, while it's a positive avenue, is not the only route, which automatically labeled him a heretic. Um, he also said that church teaching should only come from the Bible, um, and those are the only ones that should uh, definitely be followed. At this point, there was a lot of canon law. We talked about canon law being church law, and he saw some of it as being uh, not accurate or not helpful, and he thought that they should go back directly to the Bible's teachings, and this idea that all people of faith were equal. Um, at this point, really only priests and monks and other clergy members could be the ones that would interpret the Bible, and he said, no, let's put it into the people's hands. Let's translate it into the vernacular into the common language that people spoke. So translate it into German or into English or into French and let people read it. And the Pope had been really hesitant to that up to this point because he said that they would misinterpret it. So the major person that's on the other side of Martin Luther is Pope Leo X. Uh, Leo X feels very threatened by Luther because Luther was stirring up all this discontent. People were getting really riled up and he was excommunicated by the Pope. Um, Pope said, you need to take back what you're saying. And he says, I can't. I can't take it back. I still believe it. I can't take back something that I believe. So he's excommunicated. Uh, at which point we have a trial. Um, trial by Emperor Charles V in a city called Worms or Worms. So if, sometimes it's called the Diet of Worms, uh, the Diet of Worms, which would be uh, the trial at Worms or Worms, the city, but Diet of Worms sounds really gross. Um, but the, the Diet of Worms was not much happier, to be honest, um, because he was branded an outlaw, he was branded a heretic, nobody could take care of him, anything else like that. Thankfully, we're going to see how he does get rescued and actually ends up going into hiding for a long time and translates the New Testament into German, into the vernacular, uh, while he's in hiding. So, Luther's followers eventually stopped trying to reform the Catholic Church, and they decided to break away from it. And this is where we start having a split between Roman Catholicism and Protestantism. So Protestant, you see that, wrote, that uh, root is protest. They're protesting the Catholic Church. They become Protestants. So one brand of Protestants, one group that's protesting is Lutherans, people that followed the ideas of Luther. We're going to talk about other people like Baptists or Presbyterians or some of these other groups too that also break away from the Catholic Church as a whole they're generally known as Protestants uh, and you can see here um, on the map there's all kinds of different things going on here in a lot of parts of Europe Roman Catholicism is still pretty important but there's a lot of Protestant areas this this peach color in uh, the US in Northern Europe uh, so there's some different areas where that ends up being are playing more of a big role. Now this doesn't go gentle. This isn't something that is super 
easy and uh, adaptable. This idea that some people are just going to break away. Because remember, the entire political system in the Middle Ages revolved very closely around the church. That was an important piece of it. So we actually have things such as the Peasants' Revolt that happen, where uh, German peasants kind of go crazy. Um, they say, we're not going to be serfs. We're all equal. We don't, we don't believe that you should be the lord of this manor. Um, they start throwing things out, any kind of rules, any kind of semblance of civilization. They pillage, they burn, they destroy everything. And Luther's like, hey, wait a second. This is not what I had in, in mind after about 100,000 people die, which is not pleasant. Um, so we start having all these different conflicts. Um, what's going to happen? Is each territory going to be able to decide do they want to be Catholic or Protestant or Catholic or Lutheran or what's going to happen and we end up having the emperor go to war against all these German princes because the German princes also see this as an opportunity to rebel against the church. I remember we'd had that church and state tension for so long and all of a sudden here's Luther and all these people that think maybe the church is wrong and a lot of these political leaders jump on it. They think this is a great time for me to assert my independence and my own power. So Charles V tends to be pretty uh, forceful right away. Um, but even after he wins, he can't force them all back into the church because beliefs have changed at this point. Now there's a little bit of division between people and their own, di their own beliefs. So by 1555, um, you know, about a generation after Luther first posted the 95 Theses, uh, Charles V eventually calls it. He says, you know, I don't care what happens anymore. This is ridiculous. So many people have died. Um, and he calls everyone together to the city of Augsburg, and he says, each prince, each German prince can actually decide now, do they want their area to be Catholic or do they want it to be Protestant? And after this point, they really do get to decide which one they want to be. Now, everybody in that area had to be the same, but they didn't all have to be Catholic. Um, and it marks a major shift away from this idea of Christendom, which uh, is part of the reason why a lot of times we mark the end of the Middle Ages at about 1500, right about when Luther is starting to, you know, Luther and people like him are starting to buzz about what some of these different ideas might be. Now, if you look at this chart about world religions, this goes back to what we saw in our previous unit. Um, the biggest piece of the pie actually belongs to Muslims um, as far as something that might be all together. But when you add up all the different types of Christians, it ends up being a bigger piece of the pie overall. Um, so you can see Catholics 16.99% as far as in 2007, Protestants about 578 and then down from there other little areas. And some people are going to combine the other Christians with the Protestants. It kind of depends on who you ask. Another chart here that kind of puts them all together, Christianity then being about 33% on this chart. And again, it depends on how you ask people. So lots of different things coming up here um, as we finish up this lesson. Uh, make sure to finish up your notes as instructed by your teacher. And make sure to uh, turn in your notes to your teacher if they've asked you to. Thank you.